Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel. I'm VP of Clinical Care here at Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, and we're really thrilled to have some excellent uh, clinicians and parent and patient representation on today with us as we kind of just circle back to one of the conversations that we had this summer during annual conference that deserved some additional time to dig in a little bit further. So we have a set of three wonderful pulmonologists, Dr. Oren Cooper of uh, Children's Hospital Colorado, Dr. Richard Schell at Nationwide Children's in Columbus, Ohio, and Dr. Dan Sheehan, who is in Buffalo, New York. Um, in addition, we also have Don Rezkala who is a parent of um, a little guy, Alex, that has Duchenne. So she'll have some great perspective as well as Vroom Viswanathan, who is a adult man living with Duchenne, who will be able to provide some really great perspective as well. And I know that Dan, you've got some friends with you and I'll let you introduce them um, here shortly once we get to that point. Um, but I think for the sake of time, I know we have a ton of information to cover as it pertains to pulmonary care throughout the lifespan. I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Oren Cooper. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to um, spend a little bit more time and try to answer um, some questions that you have. Uh, I want to go back to the talk that we gave a few months ago, just to remind people of, of some of the basics that we went over. So I'll talk for a couple of minutes, and then I'll turn it over to Don, who can share the, uh, the parent uh, experience. Um, so our part is going to be talking about uh, our younger kids with muscular dystrophy and uh, respiratory management. Can you have the next slide? Great, thank you. So, uh, so this is taken out of the most recent care guidelines that were published back in 2018. And um, I think this is a useful table to, to think about what things we need to do and what we need to look out for, depending on the uh, stage of ambulation that our patients have, or our kids have. So I'm going to take the, the left column, the ambulatory stage. So really, in terms of assessment, what we're looking for is uh, pulmonary function, tracking this over time, uh, because we know that kids who are ambulatory tend not to have respiratory issues uh, with muscular dystrophy. However, we also uh, do some screening in terms of asking questions um, and evaluating whether or not kids have any issues during sleep, because that's often the first place that we see uh, an impact on breathing. And so um, we talk about getting a sleep study if there are signs or symptoms of problems breathing during sleep, like sleep apnea. And then the, one of the big things that we have to remember to do is immunize our children. Uh, standard immunizations are recommended. There are some modifications for that if children are on steroids, uh, but generally speaking, uh, kids should be immunized against everything that uh, other kids are immunized for. Uh, and then we also talk about yearly influenza vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines, so vaccines against pneumonia. Let's go to the next slide. And maybe we'll skip this one and go to the next one. Okay, so what are pulmonary function tests? So there are really four pieces of data that we look at in pulmonary function tests. And these are them. So the forced vital capacity is how much air you can exhale after taking a, a full deep breath and filling the lungs. That just tells us how much space is there in the lungs for air. That tends to be normal in kids in the ambulatory stage, but can go down. Um, as they become non-ambulatory. And that's our, probably our best marker of lung function in kids with muscular dystrophy. We look at peak cough flow or how fast does air come out when I cough. That's an important test of our respiratory muscles because if we can't cough, then we can, um, then it, there's a higher chance of getting bronchitis and pneumonia when we get respiratory infections. And then we look specifically at muscle force that maximal expiratory and inspiratory pressures that the muscles can generate. And these are nice tests because they isolate different muscle groups. So kind of like your physical therapist or your uh, neurologist test different muscle groups uh, with their different tests. These are tests designed to isolate respiratory muscle groups to see if there's a weakness in one or the other or both. So the expiratory pressure is how hard can I blow out? So 
it's like blowing against a brick wall, just how, how hard can I blow against it? And then maximal inspiratory pressure is the same, but sucking in, how hard can I pull air? And that really helps us understand the respiratory muscles. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. I guess that was, so let's transition to, to Don. We, we had a slide uh, earlier um, in our previous presentation for uh, Alex to kind of ask questions, but uh, Alex uh, is appropriately in school today. So uh, we should, so let's turn it over to Don. And I'd love to hear what your perspective is on, on having a, a young boy with, with muscular dystrophy and how respiratory care plays into the bigger picture of, of who he is and what clinical is like. Yeah, thank you. So as I shared with the team during our conversation this summer, um, it's it's interesting in terms of how it how it plays in. And I guess, you know, in the world of navigating those early ages of muscular dystrophy, it's somewhat, I would say, a relief in a way if parents can appreciate that we're not too focused right now on the breathing. I'm certainly completing the tests throughout the assessments and the time with the doctors is really critical. Um, but for us in the stage that we're in right now, Alex just turned 10 earlier this year, and we're fortunate that we are not getting too deep right now into the breathing, but we do know it will come and we are educating ourselves through the clinicians and through the visits and the time that we have. I think the most difficult part for us, quite honestly, during the clinic could be the assessments that you mentioned that we go through. And thankfully from other parent friends and panelists like this, I've learned that that's normal uh, because as a parent, when you're sitting through the clinic visit and you have that wonderful opportunity to have all of those teams of doctors with you, it's a really long day and it can be a really long time there. And it's a great opportunity to see everyone in one, one stop. But for those of us with younger kids, it's a really long day. <laughs> and so keeping them engaged and keeping them able uh, and interested to complete the assessments is kind of what we really tackle a lot. Um, our son, Alex, has what we affectionately have learned to call Duchenne brain. And what that means is that he struggles with focus and some other executive skills. And so we've learned um, through time that sometimes the breathing assessments are best to be done early in the visit for that day because he's still excited to be there. He's excited to meet everyone. He wants to be on stage and get all the attention. And it's a good time to complete what are difficult assessments for him. So with that Duchenne brain, he has a lot of sensitivities and behavior issues. And I just think it's important for our other parents to appreciate and maybe relax a little bit, knowing that those of us kind of go through that and we understand what that is. And from a clinician standpoint and from some of the therapist standpoints that complete those assessments, it's really difficult for Alex to complete them. He doesn't like to put the things in his mouth and pinch his nose and all of that. And uh, one thing that I'm learning is it can also impact the outcomes of those assessments as well. And so recently we thought we were gonna be in a cough assist situation, but I had to um, have a conversation with the clinicians and the therapists and say, hey, I really think it's a behavior thing. He just really, the test was at the end of our visit that particular time and he was just not having it. Um, so, you know, we just are navigating the world, I think in the early stages, as you described doctor and for us, it's more about the behavior and kind of getting through the assessment so that we can start to get some data collected on him. I think that's a, those are really good points that we as clinicians have to take into account what else is going on with, with our patients. And um, the, the data, it, the data we get is only as good as, um, as the quality of it. And so we, we have to make sure that the quality is good. And if it's not, then we have to figure out other ways of assessing. So ask mom, hey, do you think he, he did the tests as well as he could today? Or was that, was, was there a behavioral component? That's really important. Now, Don, I, I know that um, Alex had a sleep study, I believe. Can you tell us his and your experience with that? Sure, he did. Uh, the reason why we triggered a sleep study pretty early, he was probably, gosh, I think seven or eight years old. He was waking a lot in the middle of the night. He was having a really hard time getting to sleep and we were just having all kinds of sleep issues. This wasn't abnormal. He had had similar or trouble 
getting, waking, all of those things um, since he was young. And so we thought that it could be related to Duchenne. So we went ahead and did the sleep study. Um, those of you who've been through the sleep study, it's, it's interesting. We have some really fun pictures of Alex all hooked up uh, that night. And thankfully, um, you know, it wasn't too much of an ordeal. It isn't overnight, obviously. And, you know, thankfully a parent can be in the room with them for comfort. But um, sure enough, that night, Alex fell asleep without issue, slept through the night and had no problems at all. And so I guess, thankfully, we learned that we weren't, um, you know, in a situation where we needed um, the help breathing wise. And it wasn't, I would say, Duchenne related in terms of lungs. Um, but I do think it's behavior related, which I would argue probably goes back to Duchenne. So um, we did do that sleep study really early. I know we could end up going through it again. And he actually had that experience now under his belt and with all of his behavior and anxiety, hopefully next time he'll remember it wasn't that big of a deal if we have to do it again. Really important to put all of that in, in context that, um, a sleep study can help us not just with breathing issues, but also figure out what else might be going on. It's really important for us to be able to put aside sleep issues or sleep related breathing issues at this stage so that you can focus all that you do for Alex on what's right. So I think even a negative sleep study is actually really helpful. In this case. I think we should probably turn it back to Rachel. Is that right? Yeah, so at this point, we're gonna go ahead and move to our next presenter, but a quick reminder to everybody, please send your questions in through the chat box, whether for Dawn or for Dr. Cooper or anybody else on the call today. Um, I, I think that those questions are, are super fun to dig into. And so we certainly want you to send them to us. So as you think of them, drop them in, we'll be sure to dig in. So now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Shell. I'm learning, you know, we always forget to unmute ourselves. Um, I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Of course, now I can't see anybody. Can you see my screen? We can see you, but we cannot see your screen. All right. Give me a second here. How about now? Yep, we can see your whole desktop. All right. So um, some of this might overlap between um, the three of us, but I um, am going to kind of take in 10 minutes or less um, the whole part of um, using non-invasive ventilation and when we start thinking about that. and. I appreciate um, many things that Dawn said because it, it really hits home when we talk about not only behavioral issues with PFTs, but um, I've had many uh, young men with, with um, Duchenne and other you know, medical problems go to a sleep study and you know, the sleep tech wants you to lay on your back and you know, not move and you have thousands of leads and things connected to you and people who have sensory issues um, or behavioral concerns sometimes have a lot of difficulty. But I want to start with the muscles because I think that when you go to a, a clinic visit, you know, there's a lot of people in wheelchairs and everybody's focused on the PTs and the OTs and things like that. Um, and, you know, I use the analogy and I'm going to use it again here, um, is that, you know, the support that we give, the, the cough assists, the BiPAP, you know, all the things that we do to clear the chest and help people breathe really is the wheelchair um, for um, the lung muscles. Um, and there's a lot of lung muscles, just like there's a lot of muscles in the legs. Um, and, you know, I sometimes start by asking some of these young men, like, well, what would you do if I took away your, these are specifically for people who don't do their cough assist pretty regularly or don't use their BiPAP. You know, I ask, well, what if I took your your wheelchair away. And they always look at me like I'm absolutely crazy. Um, but, you know, they finally, they usually get it. Um, and it really depends on where that stage is. So this is just a different way of looking how Oren had talked about, but I'm going to kind of focus on more the, like this, this stage three to stage four, when we, you know, start noticing that they are having some trouble at night. And Don also brought up the fact that, 
um, the the idea of of a change in a sleeping pattern. Like we will always ask, you know, what? How do you do? You normally wake up one or two nights a week, and then suddenly you're waking up five times a week, and you know they want to roll over. But my question is, like, is it that the breathing issues are picking or are, are making them wake up, and they have to move to get more comfortable? Um, so it's kind of a chicken or the egg. And sometimes doing a sleep study, even though it's not necessarily the most fun, um, sometimes is the right thing to do because we can pick things up early. And this is just, you know, this is, this could be, you just can replace the cough assist here with a BiPAP, but I, I really wanted to hit home too how important chest therapy is. And when you get to a stage in, in a disease process where you can't clear those secretions anymore, we have the ability to, to help with that. Um, whether or not that's a cough assist um, or if we're using the BiPAP at night, but you know, I, it, it's really just a wheelchair and it's really just for our lung muscles. So that was my first attempt at PowerPoint animation a long time ago, so I have to use it every time. But I was asked to talk more about the sleep study and um, BiPAP use. So this is just a cartoon that kind of talks about all the things that happen during a sleep study and I have to say that this um, cartoon guy looks much more comfortable than I think it actually is in reality. And I sometimes say to myself that I should probably just get a sleep study so I can see what it's like, but I'm afraid of what they'll find. Um, so um, from you know, the standpoint that we have to take into, a, into account, you know, why do we get a sleep study? Are they having behavior changes during the daytime? Are there sleep issues that they're having problems with? Do people feel more tired? Are they waking up more? Is it just simple snoring? You know, some young men with Duchenne who are on steroids and gain a lot of weight will have more obstructive problems. Um, and sometimes we will refer people to ear, an ear, nose and throat doctor to look to see if tonsils and adenoids could be a problem. But headaches, you know, first thing in the morning, um, you know, I kind of feel like if people are having headaches in the morning or if we're checking a carbon dioxide level in clinic and it's elevated, we might have missed the boat already. Um, but we also look at the numbers that we get on pulmonary function tests to try to determine whether or not um, it's kind of time to, to look at getting a baseline sleep study. But a sleep study is really, at least at our hospital, you come in at six o'clock at night, you kind of get set up, they kind of get you comfortable as much as you can be. Um, and they probably put lights out at some time that most of our young men with Duchenne do not go to bed. Um, but, you know, um, sometimes it works out. And then usually it's done early in the morning and you're, you're, they take all the leads off and you get to go home and wash out the glue that's all stuck to their head. Um, but, you know, other than that, it does give us a lot of really good information if it, if it works. Um, and the reason we do it is that when you have weakness, um, and I put good gas and bad gas here, but you know the good gas is the oxygen. So early on in the disease process, if you have obstructive sleep apnea, sometimes the good gas, the oxygen can drop because your tonsils are obstructing your breathing. Um, and this may lead to some increase in the carbon dioxide, which is the bad gas. Um, but you know this may cause more waking up. You know, you could have less sleep or poor sleep. Um, it can lead to daytime symptoms, which it can also lead to, continually increasing that um, carbon dioxide level. And then we get to a point where we, we see what we call nocturnal hypoventilation um, or basically just shallow breathing when, you, when you're sleeping at night. And that's when we start talking about the need for some support and BiPAP is the appropriate support um, for a young man with neuromuscular disease. Um, we look at BiPAP as what we call non-invasive because we use it with a mask. Um, all it is, is it is, like I said, a wheelchair helps your legs get around. This, this BiPAP really just helps you take a breath in, but it also helps keep your lungs open. So there is something out there called CPAP as well. And CPAP really helps keep the, CPAP is the part that keeps your lungs open and the extra breath that BiPAP gives kind of helps you take that extra breath. So it gets your muscles and your diaphragm to the place where um, it needs to be. And overall just helps make so you're breathing easier at night, so you're not working so hard. Um, I'm not going to get into invasive ventilation, and that just means it, you know you could use the word invasive ventilation when you go to surgery and you have a, a, a anesthesiologist puts a tube there to help you breathe. But some 
patients, when they get to the point of using BiPAP more than they would like during the day, they will choose a tracheostomy tube, which is a, a connection that goes directly into your airway, but you can be at home for that. And some people choose it and some people really don't. So, you know, from that standpoint, I know we have other speakers on here and I know that Dan is going to talk a little bit more about um, ventilation and my friend Varun is going to talk about his sit ventilator there. So I'm going to stop there, Rachel, and um, let some of these other people talk. Wonderful. Thank you. Unshare my screen. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Is... That was, yeah, take your time. Um, perfect. Okay, cool. So next up, we are going to hear from Dr. Dan Sheehan. He has a couple of his teammates with him that he is going to introduce. And I think that this is really great because it really highlights the importance of pulmonary care being a, a team approach. Um, so at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Sheehan, who is going to introduce his team, as well as um, chat a little bit with Varun about his own experiences. Great. And Rachel, can you see our screen? It looks awesome. Okay, great, great. So I'm Dan Shen, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist. I'm here today with two of our respiratory therapists, Sandy Prentice, who helps us out with um, on the outpatient side, and Lisa Flattery Walsh, who helps us out on the inpatient side. And this is actually National Respiratory Care Week. So mm -hmm. I want to thank publicly our respiratory therapists. They are my right hand, they are my left hand. And across the country, it's that team of respiratory therapists, clinic, uh, physicians, as well as families that make this all work and workable when you need uh, breathing support. Um, and I would encourage you to get to know your respiratory therapist who's on your team, who's in your clinic, as well as your outpatient respiratory therapists that work with the home care companies. It's gonna, next slide, just one sec. So this is a uh, drawing that I, I've shown before. This is a slide of when individuals with muscular dystrophy will have breathing muscle weakness that requires equipment to support either a weak cough, weak breathing asleep, or weak breath breathing when awake. And every everyone with Duchenne is different and will need support equipment proactively at different times. Some boys will need a cough sits in their early teens some not until they're in their 20s. Some will, will need breathing support like BiPAP in their early teens, some not until their 20s. And some uh, will need breathing support when they're awake in their late teens, early 20s. But probably by about 30 years of age, most everybody has a cough assist, some way of supporting them when they are asleep at night, as well as a way of supporting their breathing during the day when they're awake. So there are signs and symptoms just as important as the pulmonary function test. So with a weak cough, it's often, when somebody's cough is weak and it's gonna kind of tip them over if they get a lower chest infection, sometimes this occurs without any symptoms at all, but some individuals will have a persistent chest congestion or a rattle, and their cough will actually be just a throat clear, or they, <coughs> <coughs> and that will be the extent of their cough. For those individuals that have weak breathing asleep, as Dr. Shell pointed out, they may have restless sleep, they may need to be repositioned, they may snore, they may sweat with sleep, and then they can have that morning headache if their body CO2 climbs while they're sleeping. They may also want to take more naps during the day, they may have mood changes, and there may be a change in school performance. And this is similar symptoms that we see with uh, individuals without muscular dystrophy when they have impaired sleep as well. And then as far as breathing awake, there may be this sensation of being short of breath or breathing fatigue. They may be breathing faster. They may have a soft voice. And even during short sentences, they may, may, may need to take a breath in in order to complete the sentence. So you've heard about CPAP, BiPAP, ventilator. CPAP really is just one continuous positive airway pressure, and it's really there to keep the throat open. Some uh, boys and men with muscular dystrophy, sometimes with uh, oral steroids, that will cause some fat deposition in the back of their throat, and they may need CPAP you know, sometime between 5 and 15 years of age. 
that buy level support, which Dr. Shell spoke about, there's this background pressure and EPAP and expiratory pressure that holds the throat open. And then there's that inspiratory pressure, the IPAP, which is gives you that assistance of pressure every time you breathe in. And then as far as the ventilator, we either ventilate people with either volume or pressure breaths. Um, and when we use sip breaths, we typically are giving individual volume breaths so that they can take a volume breath, take another volume breath, and maybe even a third volume breath to really stretch and open their lungs. And Varun has um, a sip ventilator that he uses. And so what you'll see is a, a regular ventilator with a mouthpiece that kind of coils around from the back that anytime that an individual wants that extra breath, they just lean into it, open their mouth and take anywhere from one to three breaths to get that big breath. So the takeaways are really to be proactive, not reactive, um, get the pulmonary function testing done, share any symptoms that you have with your team, share it with your respiratory therapist, your nurse, your physician, anybody who's on that team, and ask questions. You know, we will, it's not easy to start these um, devices, but we can work with you in order to make, make it work for you. So definitely ask questions, definitely share any challenges that you have. Uh, Varun, do you want to let people know a little bit about when you started the cough assist, when you started the BiPAP, and when you started the SIP ventilation, and maybe the why behind that as well? Behind the SIP ventilation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I started using the cough assist when I was around 22 or 23, right, right in the middle of college, and then I started using the Bi CPAP first, and I switched to BiPAP around maybe 24 or 25. And recently, I, I'm 31 now, the last seven months, maybe six or seven months, I've been using the SIP. And so with the cough assist, at least it was very clear. I was, it was harder to cough things out. And when I got a cold or something, it would definitely be noticeable that I would have to struggle more and the cough assist was really helpful for me and i would say that the bipap was very beneficial but it took me a long time just to get used to wearing it and even now there are some days where it can make me feel claustrophobic or a little bit anxious wearing something on my face but i think it's that's been an ongoing process just to get used to all the equipment and I think the SIP one was seemed to be a little felt more intrusive because there was all it's always there during the daytime. But I think I I, I have seen a huge difference when I use the SIP went regularly, especially in the evening. I feel a lot less tired. I think the fatigue builds up on itself. That I start out feeling okay in the morning and then slowly my lungs start to bother me. So I think if it's still been a work in progress to figure out when I need to use it. I think it's, a lot of it has to do with the individual person figuring out what times of the day you're tired and trying to do it beforehand and not just wait till I'm really out of breath. So, so Varun, so early in the day, you may not take as many sips as you take later in the day before you go to sleep and go on, on your BiPAP. Yeah. And, and I have to ask, what'd you go to school for? Oh, I went to school for psychology at Very the cool. University of Pittsburgh. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. You might have been yeah, there with so, a so, good friend of ours, Dr. Fender, who's another pulmonologist who is really invested in individuals with muscular dystrophy. Yeah, I saw Dr. Fender when I was younger in, in Pittsburgh. He's a very good doctor. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I would say that so far, it's, I'm still getting used to it, but some mornings I don't use it at all, and then other mornings I have to use it. I think things like humidity seem to make a big difference mm -hmm. for me because it bothers me a lot more in 
August or July, but then it does in the fall. And are you using your sip ventilator to do what we call stack breaths, which is taking a couple breaths in a row without ex exhaling? Um, so far, I haven't been doing that. I, I usually just take a single breath, okay. fill up my lungs, and then. But I've I've only been getting used to it, so I think we'll have to discuss with the doctor next time if I need to try the stacking. Okay. Sometimes you just get a little bit more stretch with that. So. Yeah. And so, Rachel, I'm going to send it back to you for questions. Awesome. Um, thank you, Dr. Sheehan and Varun and our RT friends. I think that was super helpful. Um, so at this point, would love for the folks on the line to submit those questions. Let's dig into as many as we possibly can today. I, and I love this first one. It seems like this conversation has really focused quite a bit on sleep. Um, and I know that this is a really significant thing that we think about. So I, I think we'll start with, well, I'll just toss it to our pulmonology friends. Um, how often do you typically re recommend those sleep studies be done? Do you recommend every year, every couple of years? Does it change? Um, what is your general practice? So typically, you know, in part, we go by symptoms, which can be very important. So if you're having symptoms at all that either Dr. Shell or myself spoke about, um, definitely it's likely that uh, you would benefit from a sleep study. And, and I'll ask Dr. Shell and Dr. Uh, Kupfer, I usually wait until the vital capacity falls below about 50%. Different places have different accessibility for sleep studies. Um, not all the places are able to look at body oxygen with a pulse ox and body carbon dioxide with either measuring it through the skin or measuring at the nose. And it's really those sleep studies that measure both that give us the best idea of whether somebody's breathing deep enough. So I typically wait until the vital capacity falls below about 50%. I would agree with that wholeheartedly, um, unless that there's symptoms like, like I said, early on when kids are young, you know, if they're having more obstructive findings, sometimes we'll get sleep studies and we will need to have ENT look at their tonsils and things like that. And some kids, you know, may need um, support then too. I would, uh, you know, I totally would say also that it's based on symptoms and not, you know, yes, we have numbers and the research shows numbers and sleep doctors would love us to get sleep studies every year. I don't know that, I think I would rather go on sleep studies though, you know, if you look at the guidelines, it does say that you should get it every year though, you know, as someone who has been in a lot of meetings looking at a lot of new guidelines, um, I think that, that that guideline is probably going to change a bit um, when they, you know, publish some newer guidelines. So, but it's really like, if we think we need it, if you're asking the question, then we should get it. And Dan's absolutely right. You, if we're going to get a sleep study, we need to make sure that we're doing the sleep study that measures carbon dioxide as well as oxygen. And I've had a lot of people ask me about home sleep studies too. And um, until they have a really good way of measuring carbon dioxide at home, which they're working on, um, home sleep studies don't always give us all the information that we need. And then a follow-up question for me about sleep studies. Would you say that that same general sort of perspective applies to titrate, titration studies once somebody's already on BiPAP as well? Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, honestly, in our clinic, we usually ask people to bring the chip um, from their BiPAP with them so that we can download it and look at it right there. And the actual BiPAP device can give us a lot of information in clinic that we can look at and make some adjustments to. Um, sometimes enough adjustments that we don't necessarily have to do um, a titration study. Um, we found here, I mean, recently over the past year between COVID and the fact that there was a recall of a lot of ventilators, doing titration studies has been a little bit more difficult right now. So I feel like we're learning a lot more about what we can get from the download from the ventilators um, that actually many home care companies can do via the internet now and just send your physician um, that information, which is really helpful. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Shell. Okay. So this next question is about equipment more broadly. So we know a lot about cough assists and BiPAPs, but are there other machines that people should be using um, on a more regular basis? So something like a vest or nebulizers, anything else that families should be asking about um, or investigating having, you know, certain devices at home? Maybe Dr. Cooper, you could start us off. So uh, one other device that I think about getting for my patients, especially when we're talking about cough assist, is a suction machine. Uh, so uh, early on, when uh, cough is mildly impaired, we can use a cough assist machine, but that only brings up mucus to a certain point. And sometimes we need help getting the mucus from the back of the throat or the mouth out completely. So I like to use a suction machine, or at least have one available for use. Uh, and often what I'll do is I'll say, hey, use your cough assist every day, and then if you're sick and it's bringing something up, then add oral suction to it. So that's one other important device. Um, other airway clearance devices like a, a vest um, I, are, are not standard of care because the issue is not that the mucus is particularly sticky, but that our respiratory muscles can't help us cough to get that mucus out. So I don't do it on a, as a matter of practice, but if patients seem to respond well to that when they're sick, then we can make arrangements for a vest. Um, same thing for, for nebulizers. Uh, inhaled medications are not necessary, not necessary um, because again, this isn't asthma, this isn't a disease of sticky mucus particularly. And so um, I don't do it as a matter of practice, but again, if a patient also has asthma or also seems to need something to, to thin out thick secretions, that I will use nebulizer or inhalers. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Cooper. So my next question is for Don. Um, Don, you talked a little bit about um, Alex, you know, doing better in the morning as opposed to the afternoon when he's still, you know, energetic and and you know excited to be seeing people. Talk to us a little bit about how you prepare Alex for his medical visits, how you talk to him and prep him for PFTs. Um, just kind of walk us through what that looks like for your family. Yeah, that's a good question. So with Alex, we have to do a lot of preparation for big things that we do in general and clearly clinic and visiting people for three or four hours at a stretch is something big. So, you know, we're usually doing some reminders the week of and reminding him to think back on prior experiences he had there and reminding him of the different tests that he'll need to do. Um, you know, when we walk in, we find out the schedule typically, um, you know, it's written on the door or on the whiteboard in the room. And so as we're seeing the schedule, I might lean out the door and see if we can gently move some things around a little bit, um, trying to assist to set him up for success because um, I'm kind of operating as his brain sometimes for the day. Um, and then I'm just, you know, coaching him through it. So I'll usually go to the room where they are performing the tests um, with the therapist and just kind of sit there and uh, be a fly on the wall, but available to jump in if I need to help coach him or get him to focus in order to complete the task. Um, you know, no different than any of the other things that we do for him just to help him get through some things. And, you know, sometimes we also are successful, um, not as much I would say now since he's 10, but you know, he was diagnosed at the age of five. Um, so we also had kind of a reward system that we would put into place. Um, not uh, necessarily with pulmonology, but when we would complete physical therapy portion, um, the physical therapist had a little bucket of toys, little uh, matchbox cars and other things that kind of got him a little bit excited and incented him to perform well and to complete the tests as well. Um, so that would be sometimes something we would also kind of supplement with some of the more difficult tasks that we knew he had to do during clinic as well. Okay, okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit again, and I have a question in regard to BiPAP. Um, I know we, we keep kind of bouncing back to sleep. It seems like that's certainly top of mind for a lot of people. So my question is for both Varun and for our pulmonologist, and that is, Varun, did you have any hesitation or you know, anxiety or concern over starting BiPAP? And for our pulmonology friends, 
how do you approach those conversations with families who might be hesitant to make that leap and start by PEP at night? And maybe Varun, we could start with your perspective and then we'll dig into the physician perspective on that. Okay. Yeah, I think for me in the beginning, I mean, it took me a few months to get used to it because it was very hard to sleep with feeling like there was something on my face. And I had to keep trying different masks, like the, a nasal mask and full face mask. And I think the full face mask worked better, but I think a lot of it was just having to get used to it and just wear it regularly, get comfortable. And I think some of it was doing some cognitive behavioral therapy and being able to identify what are the triggers that cause some anxiety. And I think recently the doctor has tried for me the something called Ativan, which is a benzodiazepine. So for some people, temporarily, they said things like that can also help, but that depends on whether it affects your breathing function. But I think that it's, it's been a, it's just a lot of trial and error trying to figure out what mask is there, and what works for you. But I think it helped me to have understanding of how important the BiPAP is because I, I think that helps to stick with it just to know that it's the best option for me to, to get treatment and improve my my lung function. But That's I think so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different factors and it. it's definitely a process. Thank you so much, Varun. I, yeah, so Buffalo team, I'm gonna to toss this to you because I wanna hear the pulmonologist perspective as well as the RT perspective, because I think that both are really important in how we have these conversations with our families. Well, I'm just, I just wanna remind people that it's, it's important for your chest, it's important for your lungs because if you get a good night's sleep and you get a good night's stretch, you'll have more energy throughout the day. The other thing, it's very important for your heart as well to have a good night's sleep. And then thinking about your shed muscle dystrophy, those are the two big organs, well, as long as well as the other muscles of the body that I, I, I like to keep in mind. So it's definitely a good night's sleep is important for the heart as well. And then head over to our, our respiratory therapist to talk about you know, how to make it work. And what they've seen is they've talked to, to families over the years and, and individuals that are actually having to wear these masks and hooked up to the device. Sandy? Um, so as people get used to a BiPAP. There are several different masks, interfaces that they can try and they should definitely, if one doesn't work, they should try another and another and another. Um, the way we worked here was we would say to the kiddo, well, what do you like, what do you do during the afternoon? What keeps your mind off of things? And a lot of them play video games or they have a favorite show. So start with 15 minutes and see if they can do 15 minutes and then, you know, see if they can go longer, 30 minutes until they can work their way up to, you know, a couple hours and try it at night. Try putting it on them if they're young. Um, try putting it on them once they fall asleep. Some kids are good sleepers where they'll just put it on and they'll sleep with it. So they're just different ways of trying to keep their mind off of it. TV, video games, stuff like that, that does help. Yeah. And even a couple hours at night is better than none when you start, you know? So if they wake up and want it off, then let them. Yeah, and a lot of the machines will have a, what we call a ramp where it will slowly ramp up to the pressure. And it's, you know, keep that in mind as you work with the respiratory therapists and the home the home respiratory services is that you don't have to like jump into whatever the, the goal pressure is. You can slowly get up to that pressure over weeks and sometimes even over months. I was just gonna add too that, you know, there are different standard kind of mask desensitization protocols and there are people in like, in our sleep clinic, we have two psychologists that are sleep psychologists who can certainly help um, for kids who have behavioral problems, but we are blessed to have Dr. Truba, um, who is an expert from a psychology standpoint that, you know, really works with our kids who have autistic behaviors and other issues to try to get them to um, tolerate the various things. And, 
you know, sometimes she'll be in our, in our clinic too and can actually go into the PFT room and, and help, you know, people understand what they're doing. But she's also good with the anxiety, but it's really like we're saying it's trial and error, finding the right mask, finding the right fit, um, getting used to it during the day, just wearing the mask without the BiPAP on just to get it used to. And I saw that there was a, a, a question in the chat about the full face mask. And the answer is yes, it, it is more risky to have a full face mask on if you are a person who cannot take the mask off yourself. Um, but there are some like BiPAP devices do have alarms and things like that. But the concern is like, if you were to say you were nauseous and you threw up and you had a full face mask and you can't get it on, that could be very dangerous. But if you're in an environment where there's somebody always um, paying attention to that um, or close by, you know, sometimes the full face mask is something that, you know, is the only mask that um, some kids can tolerate. You may also notice that there, there are masks in hospitals that they use, like, that goes over the entire face, eyes, nose, and mouth, which we tend not to use that at home as much, but there are all kinds of masks to try. And I think what I'm hearing, too, is work with your respiratory therapist to figure out what the best and most comfortable option is for you. And, you know, Varun, to your point, you might have to try a few before you find what works for you. Um, so I think that that collaboration with your whole healthcare team is just so critical. Um, so this next question is a little bit about sleep, a little bit about PFTs. And Don, you kind of touched on it. Dr. Shell, you talked on it or touched on it with mentioning Dr. Truba. Um, but maybe Dr. Shell, Dr. Cooper, you can talk a little bit about your approach with patients who have severe behavioral issues or autism-like behaviors, things like that. How, how do you help um, coach them through PFTs and sleep studies or alternatively, if they're just not able to tolerate those things at all, how do you monitor them over time? So this is really challenging because we end up not having the data that we rely on oftentimes. So we don't have pulmonary function tests. We can't reliably do a sleep study because um, it's just not feasible to ask a child to sleep in a strange environment. Uh, so then we have to go on symptoms. We have to uh, say we have to ask all the sleep questions: restlessness, morning headaches, sweating at night, behavior changes, which in and of itself is a challenging question. Uh, and we really rely on parents. Uh, this is a partnership. Uh, so we, we ask parents, do you think their sleep is different? Do you, you know, have, do you ever sneak into the room in the middle of the night and, and watch them sleep or breathe? And, and has that changed over, over time? So it, it's much more subjective, uh, but, it, it, but it still uh, is patient-centered. I guess that's the way I would, I would think about it. I don't know if you have other thoughts, Richard. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, we have our little tricks. Like, I'm sure that you know, there are all kinds of incentive type games now um, with pulmonary function tests. We just got a new system here um, in clinic and Don, I don't know if Alex has got to do it yet, but we now have a dragon that blows fire and burns down a house and a, a uh, um, dandelion that you blow all the seeds. And, you know, it's it's been interesting to see all the kids and some kids respond to that and some kids, you know, don't respond to that at all. And, you know, obviously there's the tricks like our physical therapists who have a lot of um, trinkets and toys um, sitting around and obviously partnering with the parents on, on what kind of positive reinforcement um, will help. But also with the understanding, like if we're trying it and it's just, it's kind of like, I, I do the analogous, it's kind of analogous to like helping my daughter with her math homework when she was in fifth grade like there comes a point where you just stop, like there's no sense in arguing anymore. We're not gonna get the homework done. Um, the teacher's just gonna have to understand. And as pulmonologists, we totally get it. And like Oren said, like we're gonna use our clinical skills and your clinical skills as parents to really help us understand what's going on um, at night and during the daytime. And there, there are a couple of like physical exam skills or tricks that we can use. I love examining my patients both sitting or standing and laying down. And um, we can see different patterns of uh, breathing muscle weakness uh, in different positions. So that gives us some clues that may be a little bit of a late sign to, 
compared to pulmonary function tests, but yeah. we can use those other tricks in the trick. Yeah. There might be some outcomes measures too. My, you know, there's a, a physician in France who has a whistle that measures, like, depending on how loud the whistle is, it kind of gives you a sense for how much air you're blowing through that whistle with a little meter. So, you know, there's lots of interesting things like that that are out there that are relatively non-invasive um, that tend to make it more fun, um, you know, for the patient um, in general. And that's, I guess that's what we're going after. But there are some kids that have significant enough um, behavioral concerns that it just makes it um, somewhat impossible to really get good, a good test. It also takes a really, really good respiratory therapist who usually you hear them in the clinic cheering them on uh, more than anything. Absolutely, absolutely. I love the RT cheers from you know the next room over. It's always fun. Um, here's a great question about what if there is no respiratory therapist on your son's team at the clinic? So what does that look like? Is that something that a parent should be worried about or is it something that they can navigate? What, what would you tell this um, parent if that's a concern? Well, I hope that even if there's no respiratory therapist, I hope somebody in that clinic is trained to do pulmonary function tests if they can do it. Um, I know that many people can be trained to do pulmonary function tests, but I'm fond of our respiratory therapists um, who do it. But I know our physical therapists have done them in many um, studies and can get good results. But I think as long as we're getting the test done appropriately, I, it's okay if somebody else is doing it besides a respiratory therapist. I'm I'm lucky to have a huge group of respiratory therapists that rotate and love to come to our MDA clinic. So, all right, yeah, and I know we even have some colleagues where the nurse coordinator or nurse practitioner is even trained to do it, um, particularly in outreach clinics or clinics where there just isn't the same, you know, manpower. Um, so it, it is cool that there is that ability to train up some other team members to help facilitate that piece of care. And then the next question that I have is in regard to blood gases. Should those be checked if somebody is on a ventilator, whether invasive, um, non-invasive, what does that cadence of testing look like? Maybe Dr. Sheehan, you could dig yeah, into that. Yeah. So, so typically if somebody's uh, pulse ox, and pulse ox is also called saturations, and what it is, it's how covered somebody's hemoglobin is with oxygen. And so if that number is you know, greater than 95%, then their body isn't holding on to a significant amount of carbon dioxide. And so typically you get the blood gases to see where the body is, what the body's doing with carbon dioxide. But again, if the pulse ox is 95% or greater on room air, then the body CO2 is likely at a good level. So that, that's often the, the trouble, as Dr. Shell had mentioned, it's hard to get a good measurement of CO2 at home. In clinic, typically I will not get a blood gas on somebody if their CO2 is, a, if their pulse ox is above 90, 95% or higher. So um, some, some clinics are able to measure the CO2 at the very end of an exhalation as an estimate of the body CO2, and that, that can be used. Um, blood gases, you know, when you put a needle in, sometimes it hurts more than other times. And so I, I typically don't go down the route of getting a blood gas unless somebody's pulse ox, their hemoglobin saturation is less than 95%. I, I agree with that, Dan. Uh, one other thing that I use is just appearance. If my patient is on a ventilator and is comfortable and their oxygen levels, even at my altitude, are 95 and above, then it's quite unlikely that their CO2 is high. So if their respiratory rate is comfortable, if their chest is moving evenly and nicely with the ventilator, then there's very little that I'm going to learn from a blood gas that I couldn't learn just by talking. 
Great, that's a super helpful answer. Um, okay, so we are coming near the end of the hour. We've got about four minutes left. So at this point, I would like to open it up to um, all of our awesome guest speakers today to ask questions of each other. Don, Varun, if you have questions for our, our physicians and our teas on the line, um, Buffalo team, Oren, Richard, if you have questions for Don and Varun, um, just go ahead and, and let's just do kind of a rapid fire for these last couple of minutes. Um, Buffalo team, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, we were just wondering whether Varun ended up with that uh, full face mask or whether um, so, so, so you ended up with a full face mask? Yeah, I ended up with a full face mask because I, I tried the nasal mask and it worked before when I had a different BiPAP, but we switched to the trilogy and we increased the pressure. So it was too much pressure on my on my nostrils to have just the nasal mask. Okay. So yeah, ultimately we had to stick with full face mask. And some of the, the families may not know all the alternatives. This is an older slide that actually uh, Varun's uh, former pulmonologist, Dr. Finder, who was at Pittsburgh, who's now at Memphis. I think I either borrowed this or I stole it from him. But I really like the fact that, you know, there's many noses, there's many interfaces. These are some of the interfaces um, that go to the BiPAP machine or go to the ventilator. This slide is probably since as old as 2014, 2015. There are so many new ways, new interfaces that are out there that it really is, is Cinderella and the, the slipper as far as finding out what works best for you. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Any other questions from our speakers today? Uh, I was just wondering, are there patients that, like if someone really absolutely cannot tolerate wearing the BiPAP even after trying different masks, is, what are other things do people do or is that the only real treatment option? So there are a couple of other options that are maybe not, not so standard. Uh, one was mentioned earlier, which is tracheostomy. Um, that's not something that we uh, generally offer just for nighttime support, yeah. uh, but it can be used that way. And then there are other devices out there called negative pressure ventilators that are, um, that are shells that sit on the chest and actually uh, the machine sucks pressure out to draw air into the chest. Uh, those are challenging for any number of reasons, technically, uh, but it, it is out there to be tried those. Uh, I, I do want to mention also that um, at, as we're starting BiPAP, many of our young men are independent adults, um, and so they can make their own choices, So, uh, which is hard for pediatric subspecialists to say. Uh, but we, I, I definitely have the conversation. This is a tool. This is something that I think could help you. I know the numbers could be helped, but I, I don't know if it could help you in your life. That's your choice to make. That's your assessment to make. So you can use it or not use it. That's okay. I love that, Oren. I think that's so important to keep in mind that, you know, personal choice is, is critical here. Um, and what's right for one person or one family isn't necessarily what's right for another and, and that you do have that freedom of choice. I think the only caveat to that is just ensuring that it's an informed choice. Whatever the choice is, it's an informed choice and you've talked with your medical team through all of the options available to you um, and you're making that educated, informed, personal decision that's best for you. So we're at two o'clock. It's the end of the hour. It went really fast. Um, I love these opportunities to chat because I always learn so much and I hope that everybody uh, listening in at home or at work or, you know, out and about on your day that you learned something too. Um, the biggest of thank yous to everybody that joined us um, on video today. So Varun and Oren and Don and Dan and Artiz and Richard, you guys are wonderful. We're so grateful to have you with us and, and share your insight and expertise and wisdom. Um, and, 
and thanks again to everybody for taking time out of your day. So we will certainly make this recording available to you on our YouTube channel, on our socials, on our website, if you would like to share it with a family, friend, or you know, other caregiver um, or person with Duchenne or Becker. Um, and then we'll also have a blog that'll kind of cover sort of like a written transcript of some of the questions and answers that we went through as well if, if uh, written is, is your preferred um, mode of learning and reading. So thanks again to everybody else and we will go ahead and call it a wrap. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day.